Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Positive Club. Today I have with me an amazing human being who is helping a lot of people every day. Mr. Ian Clark, it's a pleasure to have you here, sir. Can you please talk about yourself and your company and tell us what you do? I see. Yeah, my pleasure. So I'm Ian Clark and I have a company that I founded with all of my seven children and my wife and it's called Activation Products. Uh, the reason we chose that name is because we found out that when you create certain elements from the existing materials of the earth that are available to the body nutritionally, that it actually activates people to get healthy and to, to have a desire to become extremely healthy. It activates the body to stop the dying process until the aging is down to a crawl, where we now know that the body can live for hundreds and hundreds of years, even in its existing state. So Activation Products became a manufacturer. It started in the basement of our house in Toronto in 2007. It became a registered, certified, natural product manufacturer in Canada under uh, GMP law. And so we're registered with GMP, we're fully audited. We, we follow all the rules of, of the proper protocols for cleanliness, sampling, validation of the product. We're a Health Canada site, uh, site licensed uh, manufacturer, registered with the FDA as well, USDA certified organic. Uh, so we have the, the basic foundation of guaranteeing a, a good quality manufacturing company. We're in a 70,000 square foot building here in Coburg, Ontario. Uh, we're very private. We sell all of our products direct to consumer online and they all require a certain amount of education to go with them to understand why these products are so must have in the human body versus a lot of things that are in the market. Uh, we have learned throughout the years to discern what are, what are the must-haves? What does your body actually require that you're not getting from your food? So you're spending the least amount of time, energy, and resources you have to get the maximum return in your investment because people are always seeking how to support their body to stay healthy, number one. Most important thing is to have a high quality of health every day of your life. And when you get that high quality of health, wiser, more experienced, and better rather than the opposite paradigm, which the world believes, is that as you get older, you should be getting weaker, slower, less mobile, less smart, until you finally deteriorate down to a useless human being who just needs to die and leave. And that's the way that most people go. So we found out that's, that's the exact opposite. That pretty much everything we've been taught is the opposite of what's true. And when, I, when we started to realize that, we're like, this is gonna be fun because wow, I was really programmed in the wrong way my whole life. That was gonna cost me my life at 46 years old. Today, 19 years later, I'm, I'm basically the healthiest 65 year old on earth and I'm only gonna to continue to get healthier. And it's not a brag, it's a fact. These are measurable facts. In the physical world, seeing is believing. In the spiritual world, believing is seeing. You know, if you have to have insights into things that are in the invisible world, but we're talking about physical being. So it has nothing to do with race, religion, or gender. It has to do with you getting the information on how to manage your body properly as a good steward, because none of us really own our bodies, do we? But we have to act as if we do, and we have to treat our bodies as if we own it, because if we did own our bodies, it could never be taken away. But everybody eventually has their body removed and it dies. You know, we don't know anybody that's, that's still alive millions of years later or thousands of years later at this point. And, you know, in the land of the living that we're living in, you know, in other dimensions, that could be different. Okay, that's fine. That's another story. But today, the most important thing that we've learned is to make sure that we get the nutrients, the nanonutrients, the micronutrients, and the macronutrients, the nano elements, the micro elements, and the macro elements that work all together to fuel your body to support your body's ability to detoxify at all times because we're getting hit with a million different toxins in our life. We all know that from what we're breathing primarily. And then we support our body's ability to self heal, which means you're doing DNA repair. You're making sure that the cells are staying young. You get into autophagy, which is the body continuously replacing itself with youthful cells. And that ties into your thinking. So your thought patterns have to be brought to a very healthy level. 
your emotional stability needs to be brought to a very high level. And then your body gets brought to a very high level and then they feed each other. The healthy body keeps a healthy mind, the healthy mind keeps a healthy body. So it's all together a holistic being because you are spiritual, mental, emotional, physical. You're domestic, you're environmental, you're financial, because that's another part, and I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about value. We're a value proposition on the earth. So your value proposition, how much value are you bringing into your environment around you in your universe? And when our universes collide or you know, mesh or meld, then we bring benefit to each other. So Activation Products is all about having the most definitive products that supply all those fuels that you need to stay healthy and live a very long time. So I was raised in Canada, you know, in uh, Ontario. I spent the first 18 years of my life going through the mainstream and uh, ended up going out to Alberta. When I was 18 years old, I hitchhiked out west and I had hair like out to here, I had a huge afro. You had afro. <laughs> I can share some pictures, <laughs> they're pretty intense. Uh, but I went out there and I worked for 17 years in the oil field, like literally wow. in the field. I was only supposed to go out for the summer. The summer, I just turned 18 and I was heading out. But I ended up, uh, you know, I was gonna go work on the rigs. I thought that was a boat. I get out to Alberta and there's no water, right? It's just this big prairie. <laughs> and I see these pump jacks going up and down. And I thought, oh, that must be for the water for the towns because there's no lakes. I didn't know that was oil. I was completely naive. And a scrawny little hippie 18-year-old. So anyway, when we got there, I started working on the railway for, to start with because nobody on the rigs would even look at me. I was too small. And then I did get a chance to get on a rig, which I, I started working on them, and I totally fell in love with the work. Which, because it's exciting for a young guy, there's a lot of powerful equipment, everything's fast moving. It's extremely yeah. challenging. And it made me grow up pretty quick. I went from a boy to a man in about six months. Uh, maybe a little faster transition than I wanted. But I ended up, long story short, working in the oil field. Uh, I got all the way up to the top levels in the field. I never did, I, I was supposed to go back to university. I never did. I just got caught up in that whole incredible world because it's a, it's a super unique place where you learn skills that you would never learn anywhere else. And you really can't use those skills in any other industry because it's so unique. But what it did teach me <clears throat> was how to uh, not take no for an answer. Like out there, if you're told you're gonna do something and you can't do it, it's do or die. So there was, oh, wow. it was so intense and, and it's a very dangerous environment. It's very toxic. I didn't understand the toxicity levels and what it meant. Uh, everything that was handled in the oil field itself on the rig, all the pipes that screw together. We're working on wells from 3,000 feet deep down to 15,000 feet. And every connection has lead pipe dope in it. So I got hyper lead poisoned without knowing. Didn't understand. That, that price would come later in my life. Anyway, I got out of it at 35 because we had a large family by then. Uh, we ended up having seven children. I, I met my wife when she was 19 in 1981. We got married when she was 21. She's fresh off the farm, a super amazing woman. And, and we started having children. We were gonna have a boy and a girl like everyone else. And she wanted to have a girl very much. And I'm just open to whatever's gonna happen. And then we had two boys and then it was like, uh oh, two boys. So let's just take a break. We took about a five year break. Yep. And then uh, we thought, okay, we'll try again, have a girl. No, we had two more boys. We kept trying, so we got two boys and we had four boys. And the day that my fourth child was born, and we were yep. like, of course, still very mainstream, going to the hospital, no home births. We never even understood any of that. And we were in the case room in the Grey Nuns Hospital in Edmonton. And the fourth child came out and it was a boy. We would never look at the ultrasounds. We just wanted to see, you know, have a, an adventure with the whole thing. Surprise. Oh yeah, but mm, that was not the surprise my wife wanted. She wanted to hear that there was a girl and it was a boy. 
and she's laying there and the, she just gave delivered and the doctor was now gone. They cut the umbilical cord. They had me cut it. We never knew anything about leaving the placenta hooked up until it was done. You know, it was just total hospital medical environment. Yeah. And there was a nurse standing on the other side of the bed where my wife was laying in the case room. And when the, I said, I said, honey, it's a boy. And she, like these huge tears just came streaming out of her eyes. And, <laughs> and before I could stop myself, sometimes guys aren't too bright. And I, before I could stop, I don't know what happened, but I just said, oh, it's okay, honey. You'll be back here in a year and have your girl. And that was the not the thing to say. <laughs> like, what a hurt, right? And, and, she, and then she just started sobbing when, when I said that. She just went through nine months in this huge delivery, right? It was one of her harder deliveries that day. And the nurse was standing across looking at me, and she looked at me really stern, and I thought she was going to say something like, how could you be so insensitive to say something like that, right? And she looked angry at me. And she goes, do you want to know something? And I said, what? She goes, she's going to be back here in one year, and she'll have that girl. And I was like, wow. You could just feel the energy in the room from that. It, yeah. it shocked me that she was like, said that. And, and my wife stopped crying, and she was almost exactly to the day. That was December 1st, 1992. And on December 7th, 1993, she was in that very room, and she had our, our first girl. So wow. that just put her on a high. <laughs> that you, my wife was just soaring, you know? And she was having so much fun. And uh, so that, that next year was just heaven on earth for her. And then we just thought, maybe this is it, right? You know, one girl, okay. Yeah. And then, then we were thinking, oh, it's a little bit out of balance. It would be really cool to have another girl, at least to have her a sister. But yeah. that didn't work out because the next child was a boy. And, and so, she, like another hose, she called it. <laughs> <There> was, <laughs> you know, when you're changing a boy's diaper sometimes, and I would help her. Yeah. I never had it happen to me, but she had it happen to her where the, the, you know, the child's peeing when she took that diaper off and got her in the face anyway. Um, yeah, not fun. But she, you know, we, we loved all of our children, of course. And then when my daughter was three years old, we were sleeping in the, uh, in the room. Uh, I, I was actually, we were back to back. I was sort of looking out the side of the bed. And it was around nine in the morning, which was unusually late for us to sleep in. It was a Saturday. And my daughter came flying in the room. Her name is Amanda. And she came running in and she grabbed my t-shirt that I was wearing and she, she said, dad, dad, wake up. And I was sort of semi awake and I, and I opened my eyes and I said, what's wrong? Cause I could see something was, you know, she yeah. was like really like really intense. And I said, I said, what's wrong? She goes, God just told me I'm going to have a little sister. And I went, what? <laughs> <laughs> right? and, I, and I sort of shook my head. No, cause I don't want to. I don't want to have her disappointed because she was asking about having a sister before that. Yeah. And I just sort of shook my head no. And she goes, no, God just told me I'm going to have a little sister. And then she just ran out of the room. So I, I said to my wife, I didn't know if she was awake. And I said, mm, did you hear that? She goes, yep. And it was a year later, we had our seventh and final child, which was a girl. And so that was just this really unique kind of drama thing that happened with us and we never expected to have so many. I actually yeah. spoke to a mentor of mine who I called about that because it was, you know, you think, how are we ever going to afford so many children? I wasn't making yeah. a lot of money at that time because I was out of the oil field. Yeah. And he goes, uh, oh, so are you complaining about having seven children? I said, no, I don't think so. He goes, yeah, you are. He said, let me tell you something. Don't complain because <laughs> When they get older, you're going to be so thankful that you have so many children, you'll see. I went, oh, okay. So that kind of changed my attitude. In, my, in other words, I wasn't worried. He goes, whenever you have something in your life, you'll always be provided for. There'll always be things that will show up and make it good. So just be very happy. And we became very happy with everything. And everything worked out beautifully. Later on, they helped us build our business that we have today. They all just chipped in. They loved it. And that's where we realized, I went, well, he was so right. You know, that, <laughs> he was a good friend. He lived down in Ohio. He died at 97 years old in 2012. Wow. So I got to know him for a long time. And 
it was a, a wonderful experience knowing him. So then, yeah, we just, uh, we, we built a business now. Now, the, the thing today, like right now at 65 years old, I'm enjoying very, very high level wellness and health. Uh, my body is just tr totally transitioned. In 2004, which is actually 19 years for all intents and purposes, uh, yep. I hit the wall with my health, but I didn't realize how much of a train wreck it was. The first thing I noticed, well, first I'm, I'm, I was way overweight, typical, you know, 40 something guy on the earth who was struggling with weight. I was, I have a small frame, like you, you measure your frame and your elbow bones here. So the distance between these two bones tells you how large your frame is. I have a small frame for a male and, and I had, I was weighed 220 pounds and I'm five foot, almost five foot 11. And I was really fat, <laughs> so you could, I didn't look good, I was not. And, and I had this tumor, I didn't know yet it was a tumor, but I had this, this golf ball sized thing that I noticed I was sitting on, right? And then yeah. you'd have a shower and I'd feel this thing right between my legs, like kind of yeah. up against the prostate and what it turned out to be yeah. was a tumor that was attached to my colon. It wasn't a prostate cancer or anything like that, but it was this tumor that grew and then it, it so of course they go to the doctor. It's like, oh, better get this checked yeah. out. Yeah. And they, they go and they, you go to this, they submit you to a lab and you get a scan and they go, oh, no, there's a mass down there. You got to get it cut out. You know, it could be cancerous or who knows, but you got to get it cut out. And I said, no, I don't, I don't like the idea of me being put under general anesthetic and some guy with a yeah. knife cutting around that area of my body where all the yeah. male plumbing is. It was just freaked me out. And so I started asking questions. I said, well, why do I have this? Where did it come from? They go, we don't know. We don't have a crystal ball. It's a doctor, <laughs> right? You know, we do thousands of these kinds of operations. We cut out masses all the time. And, and then we, you know, we can do pathology on it if it's, you know, depending on what it looks like in the surgery. And I said, well, no, I, if you can't explain to me why I have it, then I'm very nervous about this and I really don't want to do the surgery. So I called my brother. I was the youngest out of five children in our family. And my oldest brother was a medical doctor for 30 years in North Bay, which is about four hours north of where I live now. And he was, because we, we had been in Alberta, so I just want to frame this. I, we were in Alberta until 2002. My wife was born there, all our children were born there. And I had sold a small company I had at the time to a, a company out of California who had a division in Toronto. And I had to move with my family and my business partner and his family. And they moved us to Toronto to, and I was the director of marketing on the contract because they bought us out and they asked us to come to work for this. It was a little elevator company. We did home yeah. elevators and, and yeah. we had come up with an invention of a platform lift for, for wheelchairs. Anyway, so here we are in Toronto at this point. Now it's two years later, we've already moved. And these doctors in Toronto were telling me all this stuff. So I phoned my brother. And I told him what's going on. He goes, oh yeah, that's, you, you gotta get that out of there. That, that, that's very, that can be very dangerous. Don't mess around with yeah. this, just go get the surgery. And I asked him, I said, but Doug, his name was Doug, I said, I don't understand though why I have this. Like, he goes, well, just think about it. Uncle Don and Uncle Bob on my mom's side, when I was 20 years old, they died two days apart in September, 1978. Both of yeah. them with cancer. I look like yeah. one of them, my Uncle Don. Yeah. He had thyroid cancer that had spread through his body. When he got diagnosed, they told him, we can't even do surgery on you, man. They opened him up and looked and it was everywhere. They said, you, you're done and just get your affairs in order. He died within three months of that diagnosis. My other uncle, he had been diagnosed yeah. a year before his death of liver cancer. And at that time, I didn't know my liver was messed up because I hadn't had that tested yet. I was just worried about this lump between my legs. And he end, ended up, anyway, when they died, I was 20 and it had this huge impact on me and the family for them to die so close together. One died in the other one's funeral. So I just thought, man, back then, there was nothing that they could really do. They, they did what the doctor said. They, they did the, the surgery. They did the chemo. Yeah. They did the radiation. My yeah. one uncle, right? the one that had liver cancer, mm -hmm. he went down to a freaking skeleton, man. 
I've never seen anything so horrific in my life. Like literally skin wrapped on a skeleton is how he ended up. His eyes were sunken and they were crooked and it was like so bad. Well, that's and, the benefit of chemotherapy. You know? Oh, well, yeah, I mean, he just, he just went down hard. But it was this, this slow descent for a year before he died. And my other yeah. uncle, he just looked normal because he was sort of overweight himself. And that's why, you know, my brother goes, you look just like him, you know? I go, yeah, I know, I don't wanna hear about this. He goes, <laughs> it is genetic predisposition. That's your problem. He said, I've had thousands of patients rather come through my clinic. He had 11 doctors working in his clinic at that time. For about the last 14 years of his practice, he had had, he opened up a clinic and had other doctors. So he got to see a lot. And he told me, he said, just logically, I'm telling you this is how it goes. He said, of all the people who I've helped in their life, all walks of life, all different nationalities, different lifestyles. He said, I've seen guys party their face off and eat, eat out of the dumpster and they live till 95. And other people who are eating organic and doing juicing and they're all health conscious, they die in their 30s and 40s. He said, it is totally genetic predisposition. There's nothing you can do about this. You just got to deal with it from a medical standpoint. And that was like the worst news I could have heard. And I said to him, you know what? That may be true. You know, that may be yeah. your experience, but this is me we're talking about here, okay? And I do not like the idea <clears throat> that it is just genetic predisposition. I said, I, yeah. I've been thinking for a while that maybe it's something that I'm doing. He goes, no, it's nothing you're doing. Because I wasn't into drinking alcohol or drugs. I, I'd stopped yeah. smoking when I was 21. And, but I didn't ever concern about things that I ate. Right? Yeah. I didn't even know what detox was or meditation. I knew nothing. Yeah. I was just living my life and raising this family and it was like, you know, balls to the wall every month right to the max on the money. You know, yeah. and, and I know I'd never had wealth. So, uh, yeah. but it was just this entrepreneur. And I hear I'm stuck in this contract. I had a five year contract with a company that bought my little company and yeah. it was a royalty agreement. Well, Right around the same time in 2004 that I'm getting this kind of scary stuff happening to me, mm -hmm. that company that, that owned that royalty that was responsible for that, they ended up getting sold off. And the royalty went with that sold off chunk This was called Concord Elevator. And the company mm -hmm. they sold it to got it under duress because I didn't realize how financially strapped that particular division was. And they approached me and said, so the company's transitioning. The royalty agreement doesn't fly. The, this new company oh. does not want any of these attachments and we're not yeah. gonna make any more royalty payments to you from now on, like this is it. And I was like, what are you talking oh. about? Did they offer you anything to, to, to buy you no. out or anything like that? No, there's no, no, there's no buyout that? because we'd already been bought out. They, they paid us at the time a small amount of money, I think it was $65,000 yeah. for our existing inventory. And then the yeah. royalty agreement was worth around $15 million over the course of a five-year period. It was a five-year yeah. royalty. So we were building the line and we were getting into production there. It took 24 months at least at that time. And it wasn't fully in production, but they were, we were making product, right? It, the, the idea was to have like 100 units a month and then build it up from there. But we didn't even got to 100 units a month. So we were getting royalty checks, but not big ones. And so, it just like if they didn't pay the royalty that put me into bankruptcy because we had gone into hawk to build that little company that they had bought with the idea that no problem we'll be able to service that get the debt paid off we'll probably at the end of the time you know, we'll clear 10 million dollars and then that'll split between me and my my business partner well anyway i was just totally screwed up because when they said they were going to stop i said well but we have this contract, you're obligated legally. They go, yeah, we are, yeah. that's true. That's actually true. Now, if you would like to, you know, if you wanna fight it, if you go get a lawyer and you want to disagree with what we're telling you, you can do that. But we have lawyers, you're not gonna win. And we're, what we're offering you today is to drop this contract completely. We like the work you're doing. You're, you know, director of marketing, you're doing a great job because the company had many other product lines, you know, in home elevators yeah. and, and low level, they're called Lulas. So they weren't a big elevator company. They're doing like 50 million a year, that's it. And, and they said, you can stay on, you know, you got your five-year contract that you're gonna work for mm -hmm. us, you're an executive in the company, 
the new company is willing to keep you on if you drop this contract. But if you don't, you're going to go to your desk right now and clean it out and you're going to be out of the building. I was like, that doesn't work. Okay. Because I'm super in debt at that point still. I can't, I can't Seven just go kids. and get a job, right? I'm going to be yeah. fighting them. I got to go hire a lawyer and fight a company that has horsepower, this new company coming yeah. in. Mm -hmm. I, was like, I was totally screwed. I knew I was done, that I had screwed up royally on the financial side and that it, it was something that I had been set up to do. It was my problem. It didn't work. It wasn't successful. They, they dropped the line. There were two products that they were, that they were, one was in production and the second one was coming in. They ended up dropping the whole thing and I had to concede and it put me into bankruptcy because obviously when I, if I can't make payments, they came after yeah. me, oh, like the, the outside world that where I had the debt came after me. Yeah. I, I, they were going to garnish my wage and I, and I didn't, we were just making it every month on the executive wages in Toronto. It's an expensive mm -hmm. place to live. So I was it. I just said, okay, you know, I thought about it for a day. I said, just give me one day. I'll have an answer tomorrow. I came home and talked to my wife about it. And I told her what happened and she was horrified. And she goes, what are we going to do? I said, we, we have really no choice. I, we're going to just bite the bullet here and I'm going to stay on. And I've got my executive wages. That's all I got. We have three more years to go in this contract. It was ending in, in the beginning of 2007. And because it started at the beginning of 2002. <clears throat> and uh, so that's what happened. I just signed it off and got nothing and just kept working. And then I got sick. So all this illness coming in was very interesting because I was in a situation where I had nothing left to lose. My health yep. was gone. It, it got much worse because I ended up having a heart disease problem where, where my heart would, would stop. I don't know if it was the stress as, as much as it was the blockages, but I had this thing where my heart would stop. Now, I, I don't know if people know about what happens when your heart stops, but you have eight seconds because I asked my brother about this. I would feel it stop because it, it would be, before it would stop, it would go, it was pounding, boom, boom, boom. And then it would go, boom. And then it wasn't going. And then about three seconds later, it would go, ba boom, and then start pumping again. And it would just pound for about three or four minutes after that. And this is happening like once every couple of weeks. And every time it happened, it was like, oh my God, right? Because my brother told me, if your heart stops for eight seconds, that's all you've got. And you're going to be blacked out. And then if you're, you're out and if you don't get treatment very quickly, because, you know, CPR or something to get your heart going, you got eight minutes yeah. and you're dead. So it was oh like, oh, God. great. This is fun. Yeah. And then I had my liver. I started going and getting more testing done. My liver numbers were off the charts. The enzymes were completely whacked. And one of the technicians who was doing the measurement uh, the last time I ever had it checked, this technician said, you have to go to the hospital immediately. You've got to go to an emergency right now and admit yourself to the hospital. I've never seen numbers this bad. I don't even know how you're alive. So go now. And I told him, I said, you know, I think your machine's broken, man. You know, and he's like, no, it's not. Okay. So I started taking things super seriously. And I wanted to find out how to naturally deal with it because my, you know, everybody's putting the pressure on me. All my family, everybody is like not very, very upset. And they're telling me all these things I have to do. And I, I kept saying, but I don't want to do what you want me to do because you can't tell me why I have what I have. And I got to figure this out. So I woke up one morning shortly after that. And I don't know if you've had to happen when you wake up Z in the morning like, where your mind kind of floods with thoughts that you know are not yours. Yeah. All right. And it was one of those mornings and, and, I, and I'm under this, all this pressure. And I said, I, I thought, oh, there's people on the earth somewhere. I don't know where they are. I don't know who they are and I don't know how to find them. But there has to be people who are living on this earth right now who know how to deal with these problems from a natural standpoint. I know they, they, they definitely exist. It was like this thing. Of course they exist. And they're the top level people in this category. And that gave me some hope. But I didn't know how, how do you find them? Who are they? Where are they? Because when you go into the natural space, because I've been, you know, going on Google and searching around and finding all these different health gurus and they all had their different 
uh, opinions. Like one says, you, you should eat nothing but fruit, and the other one goes, nothing yeah. but vegetables and fruit, and you should never eat meat. And then the people are like, no, you should only eat meat, and, <laughs> and all this stuff. And I'm like, who do you even listen to? How do you find the right truth in the midst of all this confusion? But the one hope I had is that there were people who actually knew. And so I prayed about it because I didn't know anything else to do. I was like desperate. And I just said, okay, God, you know, if, if, if you're hearing me on this, I, I think it's me that's the problem. I think whatever it is I'm doing, whatever it is I know about health is very bad information. And I am suffering physically and I, it looks like I'm not gonna survive. I had about 36 months to live at that point, according to a medical prognosis if I did their treatments. What was the treatment they wanted you to do? Surgery, drugs, ah, okay. all kinds of stuff. High blood pressures, just you name it, I had it going on. So I ended up, I just said, no, I, I don't want to go to the doctor because I, I remember my uncles, they went through and did everything they were told and they died right on time. And I don't, I, I just thought, forget this man, this is so dumb. So I phoned my brother the last time on this and I said, Doug, I think it is me. You tell me it's not me, you tell me it's my genetic predisposition, you say all that stuff based on your experience. But I think it's me. And he said, you're absolutely wrong. And if you do that and you start blaming yourself and trying to take responsibility, it's gonna to totally cause more problems because that's gonna stress you out even more. And you'll, you're just not gonna make it, man. And I said, no, I said, you guys gotta leave me alone I got to figure this thing out. I don't want, I'm not going to talk to you about this anymore. I'm not going back to a doctor in Toronto. I am done. They were calling my house to schedule the surgeries all the time. You know, you haven't called back. You're supposed to schedule the surgery. I told them, don't ever call me back. And so my brother phoned my mom and she, he told her, Ian's committing suicide. He's not listening. He's not doing what he's supposed to be doing. And so my mom phones me. She goes, Ian, what's going on? You know, I go, hold it. Okay. I'm really done now. I said, I'll tell you what, you guys got to give me a minimum 24 month window. Don't bother mm -hmm. me. Let me just go through the journey. And I started to go, nothing happened overnight. I mean, I prayed desperately. I was like, okay, I'll do whatever it takes. I'll listen, I'll, I won't discriminate how, you know, somebody, if they, it doesn't matter how they look. If they have information, yeah. <laughs> you know, they could look like a total hippie freak. I'm good, I'm good with that, it doesn't matter. I'm, and I'll do whatever it takes. I'll, I'll suffer at whatever level I have to suffer because people told me I yeah. would suffer. Uh, I will have as much fun as required. I'll spend whatever money I can get a hold of, which I had none at that point, nothing extra. And I will do whatever it takes. And so just slowly but surely, I started to meet a couple of people and one of the first times that it, a, 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 like a lightning bolt basically hit, I was, it was in January of 2006. And this is well, now we're going like a year and a half, almost two years into this thing at this point, right? And I heard that hemp protein was good for you, that you need protein. And I was told, be a vegetarian. You gotta, and even vegan is even better, right? Don't touch meat. You gotta get away from meat. You gotta get away from all animal products. You gotta stop all the dairy. You got to, you know, like all this stuff that was being told to me by the first people I met. And so I went down to the, uh, the Whole Foods. I'd never even heard of a Whole Foods before then, because I'm looking on, online going organic hemp protein, right? And Whole Foods came up and there's a Whole Foods downtown Toronto. So on a cold January morning, as soon as the store opened, which was at 10 o'clock, me and my son went down and my oldest son, Anthony, He's very fit. Like he was always, you know, kept himself in top condition. And he was disgusted with me. Like he goes, dad, you look terrible. Like you, you're like a fat blob, right? <laughs> he, goes, he goes hard on me. And so, and so what I did is I, I told him one day, I was, it, this is back in 04, he started doing this, like criticizing me how I looked. We didn't know yet how sick I was. And I just thought I was just overweight and I had this stupid lump. Yeah. So I, I said, okay. I'll, I'll work on getting in shape. That was my first thought back in 04. So I walked into the kitchen, I took my shirt off. I would never walk around without a shirt on because I looked terrible, man yeah. boobs, the whole works, right? Oh, God. And, and I, I, he, he got a, a Hitachi digital camera, took a picture of me and he, he handed me, I said, give me that thing. I went and I plugged it in the computer, plugged the little card in the computer. And 
when the picture came up on the screen, I was so shocked. I, I, I thought, it won't be that bad, right? And there was this yeah. totally gross looking fat guy on the screen. I was so embarrassed because in front of the mirror, you can kind of lie to yourself, right? <laughs> But it was so bad. I was so horrified. I thought, delete that friggin' thing, right? I'm, I don't yeah. ever want anybody to see this picture. And, and I told Anthony, I said, Anthony, you're right. Wow, okay. So we're, let's do something. That was the beginning of that. I'm trying to get in shape. Well, forget that. I, when I got so sick, <laughs> the last thing I was thinking about was how to get in shape. But that picture was buried. It ended up staying on the hard drive. And that computer got, you know, decommissioned a couple of years later, and it was put into yep. some archive. We, we had a bunch of computers. We were working on some projects that require computers. And both my oldest sons at that time were very, very adept on graphic design. And my second oldest son's a genius. And he, he literally was a self-taught programmer. He knew 15 different computer languages. And wow, uh, that, that's very difficult. The computer languages are one of the most difficult things you can learn. Right. But this, this guy is a, a super brain. And he's like definitely the smartest kid in our family. And, uh, and Anthony's also very talented and intelligent as well, but not in that architectural side. So then, then I go through this whole transition. Now we're in like 06, I find out about the hemp protein. Yep. We were on this aisle. We were one of the only ones in the store when they first opened. And there was a guy down the aisle, further down the aisle away from us, who was busy doing something. I looked down the thing and he was sort of making noise and looking at us and stuff and then going back and what he was doing is setting up a little booth for demonstration products for the day but we didn't pay attention to him i just we got the hemp protein from it was called mothers or something like that was the brand and we just had this little tub and that's all we had didn't have a cart or anything we we're just going to walk back and leave the store so we're walking up the aisle away from that guy and when we're walking up the aisle this guy came behind us and he goes sir sir and i turned around and i looked at him and he goes, sir, I've been trying to get your attention and you're, you're gonna leave the store now? I go, yeah, we're just leaving. And he goes, no, no, I want you to come down the aisle. I was waiting for you guys to come down and see me. And I was like, I looked at my son like, who is this guy, right? Nobody does that ever. But when that happened, I thought, oh, well, maybe I should go talk to him. So we turned around, we went back down the aisle with our little tub of hemp protein. And we came to his table and he was showing all these different products from uh, Synergy, a guy named Mitchell May, he's explained the whole thing to me, he has this company, he uses solar power, and he's got these green powders, and yeah. he puts them in a really special way so they don't get damaged. And, and he had um, another major brand, I'm trying to think of it now, it's been a while since I thought about it, but it's a pretty, rec no, new chapter, that's what it was, new chapter. And he had all these supplements. And he literally spent 30 minutes going through everything. And I was super interested. And I noticed that this guy, looked really good like his skin was perfect his eyes were clear he was super yeah. grounded he was intelligent he was explaining everything really really well and I, I told Anthony after about five minutes I, go, I said Anthony you better go get a cart right so we went up to the store got a cart came back and we started putting I said just tell me what I need you know because I'm, I'm I'm on this health journey and I want to get healthy and I said you look amazing yeah. and if I could look like you that would be cool you know and and so after he was done speaking about this it was time for us to go. And I said, well, tell me, like, how, is this all you do? Like you take these supplements? Is this how you get healthy? He goes, well, that's part of it. He said, but I'm a raw food vegan. And I, I go, uh, what's oh. a raw food vegan? He goes, well, I just eat raw food. I said, well, how's that possible? You don't cook your food? Like it's 30 below outside in January in Ontario, right? And he goes, yeah, you know, I've been doing this for about four years now. And he said, it's really amazing. It's hard to do. But he said, I do love doing this. And that's one of the main reasons why I look the way I look. And I went, oh, well, well could you tell me about that? And he goes, definitely not. <laughs> well, I'm not going to talk to you anymore about this. I don't have any more, any more time. There's people who are coming in the store. He said, well, what I'm going to do, I'll go to the cash register with you. And so he followed us up to the cashier. He walked past there and he grabbed a book, a, not a book, but a little magazine called Vitality. And it's yep. a publication that's free in Canada. And inside there has a bunch of information about products. But on like halfway through the thing, he opened it up. He goes, okay, you see this guy right here? And he showed me a picture of David Wolf, who was like a raw food, organic food uh, guru. And he yep. goes, 
Dave is going to be coming here in March. So this is two months later. He's going to come here in March to the Total Health Show in Toronto and just go see him. And he'll teach you about raw food and veganism. So I was like, and I looked at this guy and he's like a hippie looking guy with kind of curly hair and, and, a, and a poncho. And, right? and I'm like, okay, well, that's okay. It's all right. And so I, I said to Anthony, I said, wow, that was really, really cool. And I thanked him for that. And his name was Bartek. And so then he left and I never saw him again for a long time. But we went to the Total Health Show in March and we did listen to David Wolf. And it was a pretty exciting time. And he was talking about superfoods and detox and cleansing. And, and then at that, he spoke in the evening, like a Saturday evening. And, uh, and it was just exciting, you know, and then we got to find out about raw chocolate and find out about essential oils. And it was just this beginning of this really cool journey. And so we bought all the stuff, right? We bought as much as we could of, of the basics. And then, uh, and that was the beginning of a new era. And I did become a raw food vegan for about four and a half years. And I, I it was- Four and a half years. Yep, that was a while. But when I came so home did... with that yeah. information to my wife, she did not appreciate that at all. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> this poor guy. Oh man, because I'm like in desperation. I'm, 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 I want to fix this body. And I'm going to, I yep. said, I'll do whatever it takes, right? So yep. I asked her, I said, honey, we can't have any more food in the house that's not organic. We have to start juicing. We've got to do this. We've got to do that. And she's like, I don't want to do this. This is ridiculous. She's a very, very talented uh, chef and baker. And she knows, she prepares oh. beautiful. And she's a, an amazing, amazing woman. Yep. And I'm laying this on her and I'm saying, look, honey, you, let's just do this together. I want to totally change everything. And she goes, we won't be able to afford that organic. It's too expensive. But she was raised in a farm and she only ate organic food when she was young because that's all they had, right? It, it yep. was, they weren't intentionally organic. They just didn't, they weren't a wealthy family and they had their own farm and they ate off the farm. They had their own dairy cows. They had, you know, their own chickens. They had their own eggs, they, you know, that kind of thing, right? So she's like right into meat. <laughs> and I'm, I'm saying, yeah, we met this guy. And she took a look at his picture and she goes, you got to be kidding. Like, this is not happening. So we kind of got into a bit of a battle over that because I was trying to fight for my life. <clears throat> and yeah. what she actually did, she did go that way with me under a lot of duress. <clears throat> and so I, wait a minute. And, so, so, so did your wife also become a raw vegan? Reluctantly, yeah. oh, no. very oh, reluctantly. She, probably t she cheated, you know, you know, here and there, right? Or did she become 100%? No, 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 no. She, she appeased <laughs> me, okay? But because my wife has never been sick. She's never had yeah. health problems. No. She's this super amazing, you know, she's got fantastic genetics, like perfect skin. She's gorgeous. She has, you know, she's had seven children, a super mom breastfed the kids, had so much milk, she had more milk than the kids could eat. She's one of those <laughs> type of women, right? <laughs> and so it was, we, oh, we, we got into it. There was a battle. And, and I was super toxic too, so that didn't help. You know, when a guy is toxic, we get angry. And I was angry with her that she wasn't, you know, being full cooperative. So she finally complied. It almost destroyed our marriage, actually. And our well, marriage was very strong. But, and so I had to, I had to learn, oh, quit with the forcing stuff. That was all part of my yeah. toxicity that I didn't realize was controlling me. But, but I really went through it. And she watched me go from this overweight fat dude down to a freaking <laughs> scrawny little 130 pounder. I lost 90 pounds in this process, becoming a raw food vegan. It was in, in, in Not short order, like 90 pounds in about six months. And, and my liver was so screwed up. Oh, yeah, go ahead. So you, so you just ate raw vegan food and then you lost 90 pounds. Yeah, and I got into juicing. I, I met this guy named Gino. He, he's actually yeah. kind of a cool guy, but he's radical, right? So I met all these kind of radical people at the beginning yeah. of this journey. And, and what he was into was uh, growing wheatgrass juice at home in these like 10 by 20 trays. And he told me how to do it. You got to get this certain type of soil and you got to get these ocean minerals and you got to get these organic 
wheatgrass seeds and you got to grow uh, sunflower sprouts and you take the you know it would take like 10 days for a whole tray to mature to full harvest and then we would yeah. harvest the wheatgrass and all the kids joined right in so that so that's where my wife said okay all right you know we'll do this because the kids <laughs> they all thought it was this new adventure that dad's going on right let's help out so we were doing 10 trays a day of wheatgrass juice and four trays of sunflower sprouts and and for about eight months i was mostly just drinking uh wheatgrass juice and eating sunflower sprout salads with other organic greens and stuff in there and it was pretty radical and that's why i lost so much weight so quickly but i detoxed so fast that my liver which was already very compromised was even more compromised and i started to get jaundice because it was it was yeah. just too much and I'm, what is so I'm going through this really intense thing uh and the one day that where i really woke up yeah. to how sick i really was and how much toxicity was in my body ian yeah what is what is jaundice what is oh that? Uh, jaundice is where your liver is overloaded like people who have uh, sclerosis of the liver if i'm drinking they'll they'll have jaundice is you can't process it enough and you get this pigment where you turn kind of orange and you you get a little bit orange in the eyes it's very dangerous yeah. it means your liver is definitely not functioning properly and that you got a big problem so i was going too fast i was too radical but uh, at any rate the jaundice did go away uh, i just i just kept on track I, getting away from all the mainstream meat which is full of hormones and antibiotics and all the stuff was a, was actually a good step in the right direction because I didn't understand about grass fed it knew nothing about that I'd become uh, a religious uh, raw food vegan you know it was <laughs> not good <laughs> but it, but it was this funny time save your life right so you, it, it did it, it was save your it, life it did it was a big kickstart and I'm I'm like all in whatever you know when I do something I'm all in And so this is it. This is what we're going to do the rest of our life. It's like I know you're now, but anyway, you think you are. <laughs> <laughs> and so we went through that transition, but one day it was on a Saturday morning and my my son and I were moving stuff into a storage unit. We had because we had a quite a bit of stuff from a large family and it was a bit overloaded in the house. And we were yep. going down to rearrange some stuff in the storage unit and take some more stuff down there. We had these little vans. So he and I jumped on one of the vans. And I had finished my wheatgrass juice. I went into the kitchen. I'd forgotten to drink my wheatgrass juice when we made it in the morning because they they were they were making it at that time. And you got to put it through these special juicers to get, you know, these like masticating juices. Tough metal, is it? Yeah, well, no, it was a power thing, but it it is the, you know, the ones that go together with the gears. And my 8-ounce glass was sitting there. I I built myself up to 8 ounces a day at that time. And you have to start small like one ounce will make you feel a bit sick when you first start and and so every week i would add an ounce and i was at the eight ounce level and the goal was to get up to gino told me get up to 16 ounces if you can get to 16 ounces it's going to take you some time but that's where it's really going to kick in and he said it between 12 and 16 ounces is what he told me at that time and i thought you know let's do 16 but i was at eight ounces at this point so this eight ounce glass of wheatgrass juice on the counter i was by that time very used to it and i just guzzled yeah. it and we left. And so we go down to the the uh, storage unit which wasn't that far away maybe like 5 minute drive. Yeah. And we got there <clears throat> and and we were starting to move stuff around and i started to get sick like feeling nauseous and then i yeah. felt like i was getting a fever and i didn't know what was wrong. And so and i said to Anthony, yeah i'm not feeling very good. And then i started getting really sick. Like i literally started to get uh, dizzy and stuff. I went and i sat in the van it got worse. So I called Anthony and said, "Close the unit, man. That you got to take me home." So on the way home, I realized what had happened. I went, "Hold it. I drank that 8 ounce glass. I actually did drink my 8 ounces before that. I had consumed 16 ounces that morning. You know, half an hour apart." Yeah. And I and I realized, "Oh, I just screwed up. I had actually, oh yeah, I did drink that." Oh, great. Now that's what's going on. because Gino had warned me that I could, you know, if you go too quick you can detox too fast. Anyways, it made me super sick. And by the time I got home, I was a raging fever. I went straight up to bed on that Saturday morning, and I got I went through unbelievable time for the next 48 hours until Monday morning when I finally woke up after all this, but I I was 
like sweating and then I was freezing cold and I'd be sweating and I went through this whole thing. All I could drink was water. My wife was bringing me water during that time, being my nurse. And I would crawl out to the bathroom. I would crap tons of black, horrible smelling stuff you've ever, ever imagined. Usually you can hand your, handle your own stuff. Nope. It made me feel so sick just smelling what was coming out of my body. Yeah. And I kept having these massive bowel movements every three or four hours of this crap that was coming out. I'm like, I'm not eating food. What is this stuff? And this went on for the full two days until I finally fell asleep late on the Sunday night, woke up on the Monday morning, felt like a billion dollars and realized I had just dumped major, major amounts of stuff out because the wheatgrass is like a solvent, like a, not a solvent, but a, a detergent. Yeah. Right? So it went in and just kept cleaning layer after layer after layer, of whatever was coming out of my system. It was bad. And, uh, and I, I, I really, I thought I was going to die at one point. It was so bad. <laughs> and anyways, but, but that was, that was the first realization of how deeply toxic I was. Cause how could you keep filling the toilet every three or four hours, like full of this black crap? And so, that, so Ian, was, was this stuff coming out of your colon or was it coming out of your digestive system? Where was it coming out? Was it part of your out of, out of my body? Stuck in the colon? It was probably the, the layers on the inside of my colon that had built up over the years that were was softening, yeah. but my yeah. whole body was detoxing. I mean, I was literally in fever, like high temperature and then where yeah. you would get super cold and then you would like just sweat it all out. But uh, yeah, it was just this experience that I'll never forget. It was like, I was so glad when I got through it, but I did feel so much better after that. And then, uh, and then I realized be more careful, right? Ease up. Don't forget what you're doing. This stuff is more potent than I realized. You know, it was a big mistake. So then, uh, then I just, we just sort of went through that. I, I, we kept doing the raw food vegan thing for quite a while. I got very adept at it. You start to figure out the superfoods and how to make nut yeah. milks and do all that stuff that you got to learn. It's a whole new learning curve. And my wife did calm down eventually after we had some nuclear explosions and, uh, and she did support <laughs> it. And she was like, okay, this is how it's going to be. <laughs> and uh, oh, the poor girl, man, oh. she's, she's so good. She just oh. bore down. So that, and then in 2007, in, in late, late 2006, I heard about marine phytoplankton. In early 2007, mm -hmm. I had the powder and I started taking that. And nobody knew what marine phytoplankton was. Like it's a microalgae from the ocean and it was just not known. Mm -hmm. But I was taking it and it started, it made, what it did is it, it is like it was charging the battery up inside my body. That's the only way I could explain it to people because I wasn't taking any stimulants at that time. I wasn't drinking coffee. I was doing nothing because I was told clean up. Don't have any of that stuff. And I would have more energy than I knew what to do with. And I was, and I, and I, and I started to look at my skin started to clean up and there was a lot of things, transitional things that were going on. And, uh, anyway, so I went through all that and I just started learning more, but the phytoplankton, was this thing. And I thought, nobody knows about it. I got to find out about it through some weird random people that got a hold of me online when I was searching. And this guy had discovered some phytoplankton out of Europe. There was two strains of phytoplankton that were being grown in a photobioreactor under total pristine conditions. So in March of 2007, I found out about an event called the, um, the natural, it's like Expo West, natural product position in Anaheim. It's been going on forever at that point. And I was told, you got to get down there. Just go, go down there and take this phytoplankton. So I went down there with that and I showed some people in California because there were only a few people in Canada who were interested at all, which is nothing really. And yeah. down there, everyone I showed it to, they go, oh, what's that? I wanted to know about that because it's at an event where people are discovering new products for health. Yeah. And then I found out how to stabilize it in a liquid, which is now this right here. So this is Oceans Alive. <clears throat> and I... I came up with the name based on the movie Oceans 11 and another microalgae from Klamath Lake called E3 Live. And I knew this was way better than E3 Live because it was marine based. Yeah. So I yeah. took the two names. I went Oceans Alive, Oceans 11, Oceans Alive. Yeah, there you go. Right. And that's where it started. And when I so showed this, is, this one, this is this is how you started your company, basically. This is how the company started. So this is the first product of your company. Right, because I wanted to, I wanted to know like how you started your company, right? Because yeah. it's, you know you're helping some people. So this is the first product of the company, and that's how you started it, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I didn't see. even know we were starting a company. 
I, I was just in this thing where I was still working at this Concord Elevator company, right? As, an, as the director of marketing. <clears throat> and I figured out how to automate most of their systems at that time. So between 2006 and 2007, which was the end of the contract, I was able to spend most of my time researching all this health stuff, right? Because yeah. I had everything else. They, they thought I was working in my office. No, I was doing re research. It wasn't very cool, right? But I, but I maintained my job. I did the job. And, uh, you, you work smart. You know, they say you work smart. You're the perfect example, you know, automation and stuff like that. Right, right. But I didn't, I wasn't doing an awesome job, though. I really wasn't. Yeah. I was just doing the bare minimum at that point because I knew my contract was coming up to an end. And, uh, but I could have actually kept working there if I chose, like it wasn't gonna be exited out the door at that point, because they did love what I did and they did love the fact that I, I was good at my job, but I was an automatic pilot for that time. Because they, they hadn't put any of their stuff online, like uh, yeah. tech support and salespeople, they would have to phone in every single time and they would have to get the brochures and do all that. And I kept telling them, just get this stuff in a portal where they can log in and get all that stuff they don't have to call tech support every single time on the same questions a million times over. So that's why it got automated. It took me from 2002, when I first started there, to 2006, it was pretty dialed in. I was working a lot of hours during that time, even though I was sick as I was. I wasn't sick where I couldn't work. I just had to stop growing. This tumor was the biggest problem. So then anyway, uh, when, I, when I found out, I found out how to stabilize fresh marine phytoplankton that was not freeze dried into a powder, mm -hmm. into a solution that is 70% concentrated ocean minerals, which is ocean water that's evaporated down over six months in Australia, and it becomes 100 times strength ocean water, but most of the sodium chloride dropped out. So it was all the other trace elements. And it's kind of a miracle thing. If you take any fresh juice, like say hawthorn berry or stinging nettle at the time, in Australia they were doing this, and it instantly stabilizes so it never goes off. It's like fresh harvested stable. And I thought I could, maybe we could do that with the marine phytoplankton. So I got a hold of the guy who was selling me the powder and I said, could you connect me with the people making this in Europe? I'd like to find out if there's a stage when we could get the, the raw marine phytoplankton and put it in this solution. And so he goes, sure, I'll, I'll put you in touch with him. So he put me in touch with Carlos. He's, the, he's pretty much the scientist on earth. That, that is behind the marine phytoplankton production. And when I got on the phone with, with, uh, with Carlos, and I told him what my idea was, this idea from Australia, because the guy Nick in Australia told me that, you know, if, so long as you don't copy what we're doing with the stinging nettle and the hawthorn, you could do it with the phytoplankton, but just don't yeah. do what we're doing and don't compete with us, and I'll share how to do it. You know, it's 70, 30, 70% 70 mm -hmm. and then 30% phytoplankton. And this phytoplankton, it turns out, that when they harvest it from the photobioreactor, because it grows under sunlight outside, but it's in an enclosed environment, that it comes out and it goes into a centrifuge. They spin it, so all the fluid comes out, and then it's like, like thick as bubble gum. It's a very, very thick paste. And so you take the paste and you put it in here and it stabilizes it, but he didn't believe that would work at all. And so I'm on the phone talking to him. I'm not, a, he goes, what are you, a scientist? You're gonna to try to tell me that, he says, you can't do that, okay? It, it, you have a, at least maximum one day if you don't yeah. put the phytoplankton from the centrifuge into the flash freezer and then put it through lyophilization, which is freeze drying, it's not stable. So he turned me down. He goes, I'm not even gonna waste your time and money. I'm not doing it. I'm not gonna stop and do this for you. It's not going to work. And so that, that phone call was a crash. And I was very disappointed because he's the number one guy. So Dave Hunter, the guy who made this all happen, right? Who told me about the powder and put me on the call. He goes, well, there's another guy in the Netherlands. His name is Sonder. And he's, he's not doing the same quality as Carlos, but it's pretty good. It's the same strain. Yeah. Let's, yeah. let's give him a call. So we gave him a call. I got the same reaction from Sonder, except the Sonder goes, if you want to waste your money, I'll help you waste your money because he's not a big operation like Carlos. He's small, he was in a greenhouse. Yeah. He had a different yeah. type of photobioreactor. Mm -hmm. Still using sunlight. But he goes, you know, just sure, let's do it. So I had the totes flown in FedEx from Australia to the Netherlands. He made a special batch for me. I had to prepay him for that. It was a bit expensive. And then he did it and he put it in there. And he goes, we'll know within a day and a half. 
And so he, he put it in and after a day and a half of it sitting in the solution, it was perfect. Because this stuff would oxidize and go off immediately. It literally goes rotten, where you can smell it, at, right? And he goes, that's weird, oh. it did, it's, it's good for now. He says, let's let it sit. If it, if it could last two months, then you might be onto something. So I had to wait two months. And, and he had this, uh, a tote with, uh, it was like 14 liters of the concentrated ocean minerals and seven liters of the, that's what, the, it was a 14-7 mix that he made. And yeah. after two months, it was perfect. And I knew, I had this gut feeling it was gonna be perfect. And so he sent it to me in Canada. I put it in the bottles and then I took this combination down to a, a raw food, a raw spirit festival it was called. They would have these big festivals where all the raw foodies would show up and they would do it twice a year. And it, it was the fall one that was coming up. So I went down there and I had this and people there, they literally went nuts for it. They would take it and they go, wow, that is like, they come back in 15 minutes and go, what is that? Is that like a drug? You know, cause it made them <laughs> feel good. And I go, I, I don't know. All I know is it charges your battery up. And so we went home from there. That was in September of 2007. And we started getting phone calls. Well, David Wolf <clears throat> was the guy who took the most interest. And he told me at that point, he goes, you know, I would like to become the guy who brings this to the world. Cause he had quite a following at that time. He goes, if yeah. you give me exclusive, if people call you, direct them back to me. So I went, okay, I'll, we'll do that. And he was buying a thousand bottles at a time. And so within six months, he sold some, he didn't sell a lot. He, he thought he was going to blow it up and sell, you know, 10,000 bottles a month or something, but that didn't happen. And, and, and I was constantly being called by people who were finding out about it, right? Buying it. And then all these other little gurus were wanting to buy it. Yep. And uh, after six months where he didn't really do what he said, cause he was really busy traveling around the world. He goes, just yep. give me another three months. I, I just need three more months. That's all. I went, okay, three more months. He goes, yeah, if I can't perform in three months, then you can just open it up. And he did not perform. He was selling just the regular amount still. And then he called me up, he goes, look, man, it's fine. Just let, if people want to buy it, just let them buy. And then it just, the floodgates opened. We did 2.4 million in sales in the 24 months from the start of that raw spirit festival for the next 24 months, two years, 2.8 million out of our basement in, in Brampton, wow. you know, GTA, right? Toronto. And we I didn't guess get- That's how money. the company was started. Boom. We didn't right? even have, no, we didn't have a company at that time. Uh, we were just, all we were doing was bringing So there was no advice. branding, no nothing? No, nothing. We just had Oceans oh. Alive. So what we were doing is I ended yeah. up flying totes from mm -hmm. from uh, Australia, like four at a time. Mm -hmm. Four totes yeah. go, goes to Netherlands. They make it, yeah. fly it to Toronto. We set up a little clean room in our basement and our kids were right mm -hmm. into this, right? Uh, and also I, I was able to stop that contract. So I, I finished the five years and I didn't continue on. Because yep. we were selling a little bit of the powder, and then when this kicked in, we ended up getting about eight hundred thousand dollars of that money. We didn't get the full yep. for a million because we weren't selling it to the direct direct to the end user. Resellers were buying. Yep. That's how it worked. So we ended up getting. We were selling it to them for twenty dollars a bottle, and they were selling for sixty, which is a high priced product, right? Holy crap! At sixty. That's, that's a lot. Of, what that's is a one month supply. That's forty dollars. Yep. Yeah, they were making forty bucks a bottle, which I thought was very high priced. You know, because yeah. when I was looking at the market, I saw things $39 mostly, and they're yeah. selling for 59, but it sold, it just sold. And we ended up getting about $800,000. And my sons and I were doing little projects in Canada as well, like buying and selling stuff, like equipment that I knew how to do, because we were on, I was very entrepreneurial. So we were making enough to make a living. And I knew that that money that came in from that was not my money. I really didn't know how to handle it. It went into a personal account. And I thought if I bring the money to Canada, there'll be tax on it, but we don't, you know, we're okay. We're living very frugally because we learned to be learning, you know, living within our means. And, yeah. and I woke up one morning and the money that was coming into that account down there was, was quite a bit, right? I mean, it's just there. And I thought, wh whose money is that? It's not my money. I just had this instinct. It's not my money. And I'm, I'm not to take that money. Whose money is it? Well, I guess if we set up a company, it would be the company's money. That was my first thought. But then afterwards, I realized that's not the company's money. It's not my money. That's the money uh, of the people who are health seekers, 
they've earned a living, whatever, wherever they make their money. They paid their taxes, they pay their expenses, and they got a little bit left over to spend on themselves. They're trusting me or other companies they buy from with their money to give them value for their money. And I realize that's their money. It's still their money. Even though I gave them something for it, it's their money. So what I should do is I should use their money to learn more and that will enable me to then travel. So all our expenses, all the research, any products I tried, anything I did came out of that pool of money that was there. And, and you know, it, it was over that two years I started traveling. And because the money was coming in all the time, so I got to use it. And I went everywhere. Like if I met you and then you realized that I was actually open, right, and, and excited and out to help people, and I'm trying to help myself at the same time, that you would then introduce me to somebody who you know, oh, hey, Ian, you should meet this guy over here. I go, oh, where is he? Oh, they're, they're over in Europe or they're in India or they're wherever. Well, that's fine because I could just buy a ticket and go. And then I, I learned that if you uh, respect everybody and pay them for what they have, don't ask for samples, yeah. don't pretend to be something that's going to help them, right? Because you never know if you're going to help them. I would always just pay whatever they had retail. I would never ask for a discount. And they loved that. They were like, okay, cool. You're actually a cool guy. And I learned how to be different than I used to be because when I was in the dumbed down world, it was always trying to find the best deal, trying to find every shortcut, right? Yeah. Trying to make ends meet. Yeah. And so the whole world opened up. And at that point, then we realized, yeah. hey, we better take it seriously and try to start a company. So my son started a sole proprietorship because I was bankrupt. I had no credit. I, I, I had to, they had to get credit cards for me and everything during that time. They were old enough to do that by then. And so then uh, we started a small sole proprietor and we kind of struggled along for a while with that, with yeah. just this product. We had also this one. Uh, it was a transdermal, we didn't call it Ease at the time, but it was yeah. a special transdermal magnesium product. And it, and it also went really well. And so uh, we were just selling through resellers. And then some guy told me, his name is Larry Ostrowski. He's a, a, a long-term friend. He's an awesome guy. And he's the kind of guy that just gives and gives and gives. He, he came from a humble background out of New York. He got into the health space. He found out that he could feel good, right? And he met me and he goes, wow, that's a cool story, man. You got to get it online. I go, well, I don't know how to get anything online, man. Like, how do you do that? He goes, oh, let me handle that. So he had a favor from the underground health reporter. And this is now in 2011. And he says, what I'll do, I'm going to get a copywriter. You're going to have to pay $3,000 to this copywriter. He's going to write you a long copy sales page and you have to do a video. You got to, you know, get to a studio and you got to do a video. I go, I don't know how to do videos. He goes, doesn't matter. I'll give you a script. You know, it's going to be sales copy for the Marine Fighter Plane. It's going to be about 10 minutes and you got to learn the script and you've got to talk to the camera and tell the story. And he goes, we got, we have two and a half weeks from now. You got this video you got to do. And this, this email is going out on this date. It's going to go to 150,000 people on the subscription list of underground health reporter. This, uh, Mar Mary, uh, Maria is an Italian name. I can't remember her last name right now. Anyway, she's, she's really cool. <laughs> and she had this big following online, but it was underground. Yeah. And yeah. so then the two weeks went by, I went to a studio to get this done. And I was terrible on camera. I was nervous and everybody's looking at me and I'm following this, to, to me, totally gross script that I'm supposed to talk to, right? Yeah. And I'm totally struggling with it. I'm super self-conscious. It doesn't work. Like I did some videos. He goes, no, 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 no. You got to do way better than that. And so it just failed. I was not able to do the video. And the video had to go at the top of the page. That was the first thing. Yeah, for people to, for clients to see, because the, the, your story is the most important thing. That's right. why people buy your product. They don't buy it because of your product. They buy it because of who you are, right? So that's, that's right. That's... Yeah. So and how did you manage that? Oh, it was a total fail. Like <laughs> everybody in the studio was <laughs> upset with me. Larry's upset with me. You're not getting this done. And and it was a day and a half before the email is going and the video is not done. Yeah. And I, I, my son, now it's just me and my son, Anthony. That's it. And we set up this little camera that could do video. We're at the farmhouse. I'm still, str I think if I can just get rid of all the people behind the camera, right? Then yeah. I can maybe read the script and figure it out and stumble through it yeah. and get it done, right? And we tried that evening and we're all the way to 2.30 in the morning and it's totally not working and I'm completely burnt out. I was supposed to be on a flight at 8.30 in the morning out of Toronto going to Los Angeles. And we're at 2.30. Yeah. I hadn't even packed my, my suitcase yet. 
and it was a bad hair day. My face was all oily. I didn't know how to present myself <laughs> properly. And so, uh, and I was done. I was just totally upset and burnt out and, and, and in a bad mood. And so I thought, it, it just struck me. I said, Anthony, could you go into, the, go into the kitchen and get me a bottle of Ocean's Life? So he went and got me a bottle. He handed it to me, I went, okay. I said, what I want you to do is I want you to push the button on the camera. I took the script and tossed it across the room, get rid of that thing, because I yep. absolutely hated it. And, and I said, I need you to go somewhere in this house where I know that I can't hear you and you can't hear me, okay? And just leave me alone and I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna talk to the camera. It's gonna, I, I realized then, just tell the truth about the product. Forget about yep. stories and all that stuff, just tell the truth of what it, what it is and what my experience was with it. And I had to, had to do it within 10 minutes. So I didn't have a timer or anything, but the thing's rolling. I just looked at the camera. All of a sudden, I got super happy. And I just thought how wonderful this has been. What a journey, right? From 2007 to 2011. And, and how good I felt and how much I love this product. And I just started talking to the camera about my experience with it. And, and I went through it. And at the very end of the little video, I just took the thing off. I squirted some of my mouth and I said, all I can tell you is do this. Squirt it in your mouth, and I said, then you'll know what I'm talking about. You're not going to know until yeah. you do that. And then I just got up, and I pushed the little button on the, on the uh, camera, done. I walked out, one take. I just walked out, and I said, Anthony, that's all they're going to get, and i got to go. And I quickly packed up, jumped in the vehicle, drove to the Toronto airport, yeah. got my flight, and, and then I landed about 10.30 Pacific time, right, because of the time change. When I'm landing, I'm like horrified at what Larry's going to do. He's going to freak out because I told Anthony to take, the, take the, the, the video and upload it so that Larry can have it. And that's all he's getting because yeah. we're out of time. And when the, when the plane landed, I turned my airplane mode off. My, you know, my phone was blowing up. And so I went, oh, great. You know? So I'm, st I'm actually on the plane on the tarmac going to the gate. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I called Larry. I go, hey, Larry, how's it going? He goes, dude, what is going on? And I said, what do you mean? Like the video? He goes, yes. That's not the video we wanted. That's not the video we asked for. Where did you get that video? And he, was, he sounded angry. And I said, Larry, I'm sorry, man. I said, that's all I can do. I, I just, there's nothing else I can do. I, I told him what happened, yeah. you know, about the whole thing. I just one take, talked to the camera. He said, dude, this is gonna freaking crush it. That video is so good. Don't, he said, thank you so much for that. He said, everything's <laughs> perfect, right? So I went, oh, okay, yeah. awesome, good, thank you. I was like, Phew. And so he, he quickly had it edited with the intro extra. He published it, the email went out that next the morning after that. And, uh, and we did about 94,000 in sales within the first three days on this solo email. And I don't know anything about what you're supposed to perform. Like, I didn't know if it was supposed to be that or way more or less or what. No. And, and, I, and so I phoned him, I go, he goes, yeah, 94,000 in three days, man, that's really good. I said, is it really good? He goes, dude, it's really good. That's the first time you've ever done anything online. And then from then it was just, it just generated millions of dollars. Like it, it, it just, like, because affiliates saw it. So when the underground health reporter sent it out, a bunch of affiliates yeah. saw the ad. It's like, that looks really good. And it was converting like 7% or something like that. And yeah. So they're like, we want to mail to it. And that's how it started. And the, our, our affiliate program took off. And then we, we set up a really solid company in 2014. We went from the sole proportionship because we kept the quick money back in. So we never really yeah. made any profit that we kept. Yeah. And then in 2014, we started. And that first year that we had our company, we did 10 million in sales. And then it just kept going from there. And then we just put the money. I, we still haven't taken the money. Like We're just a bit weird that way. I, I just kept putting the money back into research and getting definitive products and building a manufacturing facility. So now we have the 70,000 square foot building we're in. We're using about 55,000 square feet of it for all the things that we do. And we go from mostly from scratch raw material all the way to the finished product. Um, we, they ship two different strains of the phytoplankton from Europe that we blend. So it becomes a Canadian product. But anyway. So yeah. Uh, you have um, a lot of new products. Like I've seen, I use some of your products actually. But you, so the culture of the company that you and your children have started is very different. It's not like regular companies. You know, there's a lot of food and health products and stuff like that. 
And I think that's got to do with who you are as a person. You're a very kind human being that wants to make a difference. And you can feel that in the way your business is run. So you have developed a lot of new products. You know, you have to a perfect iodine, you have to spray, and there's, there's a lot more. So how did you develop all these products? Like what happened that you went after all these products? Yeah, well, I, I wouldn't consider that I developed them. Uh, what happened is that I, we, yeah. we would, I would see certain things and I, I wanted to make sure that there was something that was going to deliver a profound result. Because when you're, most companies that start like us, they would grow really, really big, really fast, but they would have to be funded. And we didn't have any funding. We, the only funding that came to us was the original, there was a, a small amount of capital put in for a, by a medical doctor in Toronto who's still a very close friend, a family friend. And he was super cool about it. He didn't demand anything. He just said, I just want to help you guys. Yeah. And so that's what kickstarted us with the phytoplankton when we needed to buy some volume. And, uh, but what, the, what, what I wanted to do was have a direct feedback loop from people because we weren't really getting that when we were selling to resellers for those first few years. But as soon as we went direct to consumer, now people were phoning us immediately. And my son was customer service. That's how we began with one of my kids. And he, he'd never been in customer service before. You know what the stupidest thing that happened? Uh, you, know, you know that first email that went out? And you talk, like, our company was pretty sketchy because <clears throat> we just didn't know how to do this at all. So we made lots of mistakes. You know, but anyways, so this woman, the first time in history from 2007 to 2011, we got a complaint. It was one of the people who bought that first $94,000 worth. And it was a woman, I don't know how old she was, but she sounded like she was about 50. And she told Aaron, she goes, oh, this product is terrible. I, I got it and, and within, within just a, a day, I gained four pounds on the scale. And this four is pounds. terrible. <laughs> And I'm, I said to Aaron, I said, you can't, g you can't gain four pounds of weight by using one <laughs> dropper. He goes, well, you better talk to her because she's really upset. And, and, and we didn't have any kind of refund policy. I didn't yeah. know you had to have a refund policy, right? No. And, uh, and, and Larry had told me that we're going to put on the page that you're going to give a refund if people don't like it. Yeah. We would never had a refund before because it would have been selling to resellers. And so I, I actually called her back and, and I listened to her on the phone and she's telling me how she gained four pounds. And I go, ma'am, that is not even possible. And I'm arguing with her. Right. She got so mad and she goes, I want my money back. I said, no, you got to give the product a chance. You got to, you know, take it for a month. You can't tell me in one day, you know, she had got it. Um, like it. Like this is like a week later, right? Since, since we had the email went out. So she had it and then she tried it and then she didn't like it. I don't know what the problem was. She was really quite angry with me, right? And so I got angry with her. I goes, we're not giving your money back. If you have a legitimate reason for, for wanting your money back, then fine. But I'm not, there's no way. Like, and she said, I'm going to call the FDA. I'm going to call the FTC. And, right? I'm going to put a complaint in. You've got to give me my money back. And I said, I'm sorry, ma'am. We can't help you. And that's what I literally told her. That's how dumb I was. And so... Anyways, I phoned up Larry. I go, Larry, we just had a customer call and ask for her money back because she said she gained four pounds. He goes, and so what did you do? I told him what I told him what happened. He goes, you idiot. Get on the phone right now. You call her back. You tell her to keep the product that you're sending all the money back, including the yeah. shipping, immediately. Yeah. You can't do that. I went, oh, okay, sorry, man. Really, is that what we got to do? He goes, you give everyone their money back. If they phone up and they complain, you try to work them through, be kind. If they want their money back, you give them, and don't yeah. ask for the product back. Don't make them ship it back. It's one bottle, buddy, right? Yeah. And so I called her back and I profusely apologized. And I just said, I'm so sorry that I, 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 I was wrong. <laughs> you know, it was this hum humbling thing. And then on, I, okay, that's what I did. <laughs> What an idiot, right? So, oh, God. <laughs> but what was cool though, oh. is that the more time went on, the more feedback we got from people who phoned back and told us all their experiences. Yeah. They wanted to tell us how great it was. Mm -hmm. Most we had, we had like over the first four years, like 0.5% return. Whereas in the supplement industry, you're getting 15% return average. 
yeah. which is a really big deal to be a 0.5%. And it would be people that yeah, maybe of course. their husband was mad they bought it or who knows, right? But <clears throat> it was just an automatic money, money back, keep it. Unless they bought six bottles, then we'd ask them to send it, it back, you know, in, you know the, except for the, or the open bottle to keep it. And, uh, and so, yeah, we just had a very good run. But the point is this, is that when you don't have any buffer zone between you and the person experiencing yeah. your product, you learn. Yeah. You learn what it is. And then all, we, we had products that we brought out that we stopped because they were not performing well. And then we, it didn't matter how much we invested. If they didn't perform directly with the expected, like, you know, people have a perceived value of a product when they're gonna give their credit card for it. Yeah. But if they don't get a received value that's greater than their perceived value, then they don't wanna keep it. And so that was the criteria. As long as people are getting the results that we're looking for and the averages are everyone's super happy, okay, that product stays. And this, this was our hero product anyway for all that time. I knew that this thing was going to be loved, and it, and it is to this day. There's people who have been taking it for 15 years. And we actually have bottles that we kept from the original because we kept samples of everything we ever produced. And they're still as, as fresh as the day they were made. Like you open them up and you can smell it. It smells perfectly fresh. It is fresh. It's a really yeah, cool how did you, technology. How did, you come up, how did you come up with the idea to develop this formula? How did that well, well, I didn't develop really, something I, that... I didn't, give, I didn't come up with the idea, but the only yeah. thing is I did is I combined two ideas. Because the guy in Australia was already doing this kind of thing with uh, mm -hmm. Stinging Nettle and Hawthorne Berry. That was his two, two products. And he told me that anything you put fresh harvested stabilizes instantly because there's an osmotic transfer of because the salinity oh. is so high in the concentrated sea mineral that it doesn't yeah. allow any oxidation. None of the oils go off as to perfection. And so yeah. I went, and he said, like I, like I said earlier, he, he said, You're, you could do that with the phytoplankton. I'll protect you. I won't sell to anybody doing phytoplankton when they try, right? And many yeah. people tried. There were 500 circumvention attempts in the first two years of people trying to go around behind us to, these, to the producer in, in Europe. And then in 2012, <laughs> so that from 20, 2007 to 2012, that's the five years went by, Carlos, who's the top guy in the world in this game, you know, Dave said, hey, you better pay attention to Ian. They've been going five years of that idea. It worked. He said, you better better give him a call. So he called me and it was like, wow, Carlos is calling me. Cool. So I ended up flying over to Spain. When I saw his facility, it was so beautiful. He goes, man, I'm sorry. You know, I know I was really rude to you there in 2007, but you blazed the trail. Would you, could you come over to my place and you can see what we're doing? Yeah. And, and it was, yeah, it, it was a stellar moment. And they had done so much development. Him and his wife uh, built this facility. And so we ended up leaving Sa Sonder, the guy in the Netherlands, which he was very disappointed yeah. with that. And, but you, couldn't, you, you can't keep going when you can get something that's even more superior. Oh, higher quality. Yeah. yeah. You, know, you know, Ian, something very interesting, you know? When you believe in yourself, people start believing in you because you didn't stop. You believe in yourself and you push your idea and whatever you had forward. And then people start believing in you and then things just move perfectly. And I think that's one of the most important thing about business life all in general. Right. Yeah, that's right. Because I, when, I, when I started this thing, it started from the heart, really from the heart, yeah. from somebody who was getting results, me. Mm -hmm. And then what I wanted for me, I want for you. Because a lot of people have agendas for their, and I can see that tendency because you can make more money yeah. uh, from people who are not aware of what they can actually do, but it's, it's, it's not real money. Because you, you, I, so I just realized I want to know the truth. If I want to know the truth and I want to spend the least amount of money for the maximum return on the investment, I should want that for everybody else. And so that became the, mon the mantra <clears throat> because <clears throat> that's what the goal. Like, how do we get people to spend the least amount of time, least amount of energy, least amount of effort, and least amount of money to get the maximum return? and not have to do too many things. Because once I went into the, the high level wellness world and I had millions of dollars to do research, I, I found out that there's just way, way, way too much stuff. And everybody says that they got the best glop. You know, my glop is better than your glop, you know, and you should buy mine, not there. <laughs> it's like, no, I, there's hundreds of thousands of, of health products in the world. And everybody yeah. says you need their product. It's just not the truth. So I, then I found out there are categories in health products. There's what, what we call must-have, in order to have a long, healthy life, you actually have to have these things. These are functional, foundational nutrients and elements 
that you can't get out of your food. So you, you have those. You have minimum, you gotta have that. Then you have your like to have, want to have category, which are cool and they're good. And then you have your, your luxurious products, like the real luxury, the higher end stuff. But if you don't have the must haves, you can have the like to have and, and want to have, but they're not, gonna, they're not gonna deliver if you don't have this here. So, so what makes... are the must haves? When you, on your research, what are the must have products that everybody needs? Well, the nanonutrients in this, because this has every nutritional molecule known to all historical data. And it also has the, the sea minerals in it, which are good for the hydration side. So this one is a must have on a daily because that's your insurance policy that you're covering all the bases, but you don't need much of it because it's so concentrated and people take it. Like we would literally put one drop. I would say, I'm gonna show you guys how powerful this is. You put one drop on their, on their hand like that, that's it. And this would be at the trade shows, right? And you just take that and lick it. You go, oh man, that is strong. They couldn't believe how strong it was. And I'll go, yeah, now come back in 15 minutes and tell me how you feel from one drop. And they would come back and go, okay, I definitely noticed that. So, you know, what is it? And they find out more and that's how it goes. So in, you, do, you do 17 drops a day is the, is the normal dose. But the reason that this is a must have is because it just covers all the gaps. So it's like a little insurance policy. And then we found out about magnesium deficiency, how important that is. That this was the second product. Yep. We only actually had two products up until 2011. Oh. And, uh, and this is transdermal magnesium that goes into the skin. So instead of ingesting magnesium, because there's a thousand different magnesium supplements in the market, yep. but when you ingest them orally, it has to go through your digestive system and it does have a taxation, a little bit of taxation on the kidneys and various different things that it does. So, and plus you have to wait for the body to distribute it through the body to where you need to get it to. So if you have lower leg cramps or things like that, which is magnesium deficiency yep. based, you just spray it in your legs and it goes away in 90 seconds. And, and you, you do 30 sprays in the morning, 30 sprays at night, helps you sleep deeper and gives you calm energy throughout the day. And so that, that became a super hit. This is actually our most popular product now. And uh, just cause it's so easy to do. You just spray it and that's it. Yeah, but the thing with this thing is, is it's not like any other marine, uh, in any other magnesium transdermal product in the market because you can go and buy, this has magnesium chloride hexahydrate. Now you can get the same look and, and, and sensation uh, of thinking you're getting magnesium into your body by just going and buying cheap magnesium chloride. It's a dime a dozen. It costs almost nothing. And you, and they, and they just melt, it melts into water immediately and they put it in a spray bottle and say, here is your transdermal magnesium, you know, spray it in your skin. And, it, and, it's, and it's itchy and uncomfortable and it's too gross. Yeah. This is, it took us a year and a half to find the company that makes this particular raw material, which comes out of Europe. There's only one company in the world and, it, and it's yeah. ultra purity level. So there's nothing else with it at all. Whereas a lot of the magnesium chlorides have all kinds of other stuff with them you don't want. Yeah. But it's magnesium chloride hexahydrate. So it has uh, six water molecules attached to every molecule of magnesium chloride. That's the hexahydrate part. And then you take that, it takes us 12 hours to make this. You don't just dump it in water and melt it. You have to put it through a whole process where it goes through this machine for 12 hours to drive the elements into the fluid. So the whole thing is like this completely transdermal thing. When you put it on our, when you put this one on your skin, it just smooth. You don't have to rub it in at all. You just wipe it and within 90 seconds it's gone and people feel it in that short of a time you know if people have a bit of anxiety they put it here during the day anxiety has gone in 90 seconds because it's not a it's not an anxiety drug it's got nothing to do with it they're just magnesium deficient that's it and magnesium is a fuel that your brain requires that your body your autonomic ner nervous system requires and in the studies they did there's like 330 biochemical reactions that require magnesium all the time to function at the highest level. And everybody has magnesium in their body, but they don't have enough. So this just tops it up. And it takes a while. It doesn't top it up the first day, but it takes the symptoms away quickly. Like when, we, when I first experienced it myself, before I even understood what it was, a guy handed me a bottle of it and he goes, I just spray it on any place it hurts. And I didn't really have any, any major pain in my body by that time. I was in yeah. pretty good shape because I'd lost the weight and I was detoxing. But my left elbow, I had like a tennis elbow thing from being on the computer too much. And so my left elbow had gotten sore a little bit. And uh, so I just took the, I took it the first morning I woke up that I had the bottle, I just sprayed it on there and I, and I wiped it. And it's the only place I put it in my body. And within like a minute and a half or two minutes or whatever it was, 
the ache went away. I was like, well, that, that worked. So I wonder, is that like a pain thing or what is this, right? And, and so then the next morning I woke up, my elbow was back to the same, a little bit of soreness. So I sprayed it on again and then it went away. And every day it would come back. And this went on for like six, seven weeks. And then one day I noticed that it didn't come back. And then from then on, it never came back. And I, like, I still kept spraying it, but I called the guy who actually had given me the bottle. He's down in New York and he had figured out how to do this. And, uh, and I called him up and I, and I said, hey, you know, like I'm the guy you gave that bottle back in Toronto a little while ago. He goes, oh yeah, I remember you, yeah. And, and, and I said, yeah, it has, I told him about my elbow. He goes, oh, he's laughing. He you think it's a painkiller, right? And I go, no, I don't know what it is because it kept coming back every day. But he goes, no, no, that's, that's magnesium. Magnesium went in and you had a, a overabundance of calcification in your elbow because you're, you're magnesium deficient. And the magnesium joined up with the calcium and it would take layer after layer after layer and distribute it back in your body properly. And it would take the pressure off your nervous system that day because it excited all the calcium that was sitting on the nerves that were causing the pain. And he said they would settle back down again. And now you've been doing it for this long now you've got enough of the calcium gone that it's not settling down on the nerve to, to have, have pain. He said, keep doing this for a while. Don't just do it. Don't stop. Keep doing it because he said you're at the level where it's not noticeable now, but there's still calcium there. There's not enough to bother you. So keep doing it and then it'll go away. So that's where that went. Oh, wow, this is like super cool. I got to tell people about this. And so this distributor out of, the, out of California that was selling the Oceans Alive, which was Sun Food mm -hmm. Foods at the time, they said, oh yeah, we'll, we'll try that. And so the next thing that happened, where a testimony came back, it was a young woman actually worked in customer service at Sun Food. And I went down there for a visit to see them, how it was going. And her name was, I think it was Amber. I, I might not have that totally. <laughs> and it was a long time ago, right? Back in, in, in uh, yeah. early 2008. And, uh, and she came around, she goes, oh, you know, she found out I was in the building. She goes, oh, I gotta tell you what happened to me. She goes, when I was in high school, I had a shoulder injury in sports and it, and it had been aching. And she's like 24 years old at that point. And, and she said, I've been spraying my shoulder. And just like you happened with your elbow, it would, it would take the pain away for the day, but it kept coming back. She said, it took me two and a half months to where there's no more pain in my shoulder. But she said, that's not what I was so excited about. She goes, I've been having menstrual cramps in my period ever since she was a teen. Yeah where she was down for four days a month, she couldn't work. She'd just stay in bed with a hot water bottle. She goes, within the first month of spraying it on my shoulder, my next cycle, I didn't have cramps. No. And I went, really? She goes, yeah, and I was spraying on my shoulder, I don't know. She said, I don't have cramps anymore. It was literally enough going in her shoulder to alleviate the, the menstrual problems she was having because she was low in, in uh, magnesium. So I went, oh wow, okay, this stuff is even better than I thought. So let's, it just kept learning and learning and learning. Then I started learning everything about it. I read books on it, found out, wow, what's the deal? So this is, this is, we've sold, you know, a lot of this product, <laughs> tens of millions of dollars worth of it. So it's, uh, it's been a, yeah, really good to, to get that out in the market. And that, that was the foundation that allowed us to have the money to invest in other things like the seed oils and the, the detox product like Solar Solaris and then Perfect Iodine. And these were, Solaris, we never came up with this. This, is, this was developed at the university level. It's an Ayurvedic blend of rosemary, thyme, and clove. But it's the entire... What does it do? Oh, so, yeah, this is a weird one. But <laughs> I found out about this in 2016. I had quite an experience with this one before we brought yeah. it to the market. But it's a... Uh, it, they take the whole plant, not just the clove yeah. itself. They take all the plant esters and the entire extract of the plant and they put it into this super concentrated liquid. This stuff is so strong that if you put one drop under your tongue, it kind of freezes your tongue. So when I first got it, like I would get products all the time, right? This, I bought a case of these, of these from the guy. They were in one ounce bottles at the time. They were 129 US for a bottle. And I didn't read the, the instructions. I just opened it up and it had a one milliliter uh, dropper. And I was at a hotel down in uh, San, no, not San Ysidro, in uh, kind of near Santa Barbara. What's the name of the place? It's uh, Santa something, not Rosa. But anyways, I was at this airport. I was not at the airport, at the hotel. We were taking a guy to the airport who was in visiting and we were driving a vehicle, me and a couple of other guys, to go down to back to Los Angeles. And we were checking out of the hotel. 
and the, the, it got sent to the hotel, right? So the, the guy at the hotel goes, oh, this box came in for you, you know, and we were just leaving. So I opened the box, I took the bottle out and I squirted one full dropper in my mouth. And as soon as I did that, I'd realized I made a mistake because my tongue immediately went numb and it started to go down the back of my tongue because I squirted it too far back. And I went and I grabbed a bottle of water to wash it down. That was my next mistake. <laughs> by the time I, I washed it down, <laughs> this thing, this stuff had frozen my epiglotti, right? You yeah. know, the little flap that comes down to close for your trachea when you swallow something and it stayed open. So when I put the water in, it went right into my trachea, into my lungs. And I was like, oh, man. it wasn't a big amount, but it was enough that it choked me. <clears throat> so I had to cough it up for about 30 seconds yeah. and my whole entire throat and my, my mouth was frozen. And, and I'm, I'm talking like this, like, like that, right? <laughs> and meanwhile, <laughs> this is the stupidest thing. This guy named David was, was, he was in our little group traveling with us. He's standing at the, uh, at the checkout, like he's checking out of his hotel room, talking to the guy at the counter. And I, and I had taken the bottle and I, I gave it to him. I said, this is before I put the one dropper in. Because I, I, I just squirted a dropper in his mouth while he's talking to the guy. I went and did mine, choked in the water, looked back at David and goes, oh man, I screwed this up, right? But he is not freaking out. He, he was going for a, a bottle of water. I said, don't drink the water. He goes, why not? I said, don't drink the water. I just choked on the water. <clears throat> I said, my, I'm frozen. So he just kept talking to the guy and it did freeze his tongue in his throat, but he didn't choke on anything. And so he never said much. And I, was, I didn't know him that well at that time. I was just kind of getting yeah. to know this group of guys. He was a businessman from San Francisco with us. Anyway, so we got in the car and he's not saying anything. And, and I'm looking at him and, and we're gonna be taking uh, this Peter guy to the airport. And Peter wasn't there, so he didn't get the dose, right? He had come to the car afterwards when we, when we pulled the car around the front. And, uh, and uh, he goes, uh, I, I, said, I said, are you okay? He goes, I think so. And I said, you sure? Because I, I wanted him to tell me, like, he's not uncomfortable. He's not comfortable. And uh, I said, well, man, I, I, I said, it really messed me up. And he goes, well, he says, does this stuff take headaches away? I said, I have no idea. I'm just, this is the first time I've had the product. This guy told me it does a whole bunch of stuff that it sounds too good to be true. I said, I have no idea. I don't, I don't think it takes headaches away, <laughs> right? And he goes, well, I didn't want to tell you guys, but for the last day and a half, I've had a splitting freaking headache the whole time we were having meetings and everything. He said, I don't want to tell you because I don't want to complain. But he said, within 30 seconds of you putting in that my, in my mouth, my headache went away. It goes in that wow. fast. This stuff just goes right in, man. And I said, oh, that's interesting. He goes, yeah, no, I have no headache. And he shook his head. He goes, no, I have no headache at all. So he goes, give some to Peter. I went, no, I don't think so. I so said, I didn't do it. I never gave it to, I told Peter, no, you don't want to do this right now. You know, yep. but uh, you're supposed to put on the bottle, it said two to three drops maximum under the tongue, if you want, or in a glass of water is better. Cause then it just goes down. Cause otherwise it does freeze below the tongue. But anyway, so that was the beginning of this journey. What I found out about this product later was profound <clears throat> because I, I tested it for a few years before releasing yep. it. And what I found out, because you know when you hear something that is all does all this stuff, it's like, yeah, right, okay, we'll find <laughs> out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I was told that if people put it on melanomas, that it blows yeah. the melanoma up, it becomes all nasty and gnarly and, and messy. And then within yeah. a couple of weeks, it just dries up and then heals. And it peels off and there's no scarring. I went, okay. Do you have to use it every day on the, on the thing? On the melanoma, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. But you just every, take- Every day you put a drop. Yeah, depending on how big the melanoma is, but you would take like yeah. if you had a like a patch, you would put like one drop here and one there like that, and then and then you just rub it in. It's like an oil, and you just rub it in, and it goes right in, like it, it's already going in right now. Like it's the oily feels going away, and basically it's gone. Like that, you can still see a bit of a shine, but it's basically gone, and so then it starts to it just starts to nuke. The melanoma. It doesn't work on other things that are not cancer-based. It just no. it has to be cancer. Some people have warts or they have moles and stuff like that. And, no. it, and if it isn't uh, like a cancerous thing, it doesn't do much. I've, I've seen some uh, people with a mole, they blew a mole up, but I don't know what, they never had it tested, so I can't say what it was, but 
truly melanoma, it blows it up and it just comes right off and there's no scarring and it's gone. So I, I, I know one particular woman who had eight different places on her body with melanomas that she was having a struggle with and got rid of them all. And she, uh, yeah, she's, she lives down in California. But anyway, that's one thing it does. So that was like, oh, that was, it did that. But mainly what you do is you put it in water. It's a detoxification product. So what it does is it dissolves heavy metals and different toxins in your body into an inert matter. So it's not like a chelator. A chelator will cage it and carry it out. And chelators can also redump things back into your body where metals will go back to your brain from your gut. So the thing I like about this one is it turns it into an inert matter and then it just leaves your system. It also works against fungus, like people have fungal infections. And then uh, the one that was the most surprising was I was told that it gets rid of dengue fever and malaria. But I don't know anybody with dengue fever or malaria. But in, in 2019, right, right at the end of 2019, so November, December 2019, January, February 2020, uh, my friend Peter, who was in the back seat of the car, who I've known very well for all these years, uh, he had a friend from Kenya who had ties into the government there. And he yeah. said, let's test it out. You know, let's see if it even works for malaria, because malaria is a major killer. In fact, more people in the world die from malaria from any other, than any other disease every year. It's a lot, especially children and elderly. So yeah. what, I, what I did, I said, I'll, I'll give you a thousand bottles. So I gave him a thousand bottles, shipped it to California. He shipped that. He didn't ship it all to Kenya, but he shipped batches of it. They paid for a clinical, a clinical trial where you have to hire a doctor. You got to get a license from the government. You have to have a, an official thing where people are tested. So you had to buy all these. The test kits were only a buck each. So you test for the malaria before and then test after. <clears throat> and so yeah. they did this thing with, over that four month period, there were four different trials that involved 904, 905 people, somewhere in there. And, no. and what happened is the first 45%, 45% of the people uh, had one, you put two drops into a glass of water. That's it. A glass of water about that much, two drops, and then they drink it. And that nuked 45% of the malaria cases in, in the first 24 hours. And then uh, there was 50 another 50% of the people, it took two doses of two drops two separate times. So after two days, they tested negative for malaria. And then the last 5% was either three doses, four doses, or five doses, depending how sick they were. But it did 100% kill on malaria in that four month uh, trial period, all certified in Kenya, which was submitted to yeah. the government. And so yeah. Peter said, oh man, this is gonna be huge. Like we're gonna, we're gonna need hundreds of thousands of bottles to go there. They're gonna last for millions of people because it's only two drops for 45%. Yeah. Like it's literally drops pennies to do it. <laughs> yeah. And so he, we went through all this red tape and, and the, the more red tape we went through and the more things they asked us for about our company, about the product and about everything else, it came closer and closer and we still haven't got the PO for that. After all those Because years. it's cheap. That's no, I don't, I, mean, I, don't I don't know. I have no idea. The, it's a political thing of some sort. But somebody's making money somehow, right? So it's always something like, I shouldn't even say stuff like that. You know, we set ourselves up for yeah. excitement here. Yeah, I don't know what the agendas are there, but anyway, it just we've never sold any down there after all that. But that, that again opened my eyes up to like, wow, this stuff is like very cool. Everything I was told it yeah. does, it actually does. So, I've never done a dengue fe fever test, but apparently it does the same with dengue because it was all tested. This was in, the, in a private market before we got it through a tiny group yeah. of doctors and naturopaths who were just getting huge results with their patients. So they, they still do that. But this is now just available to the public. And, and me telling you this sounds like medical claims, so you gotta be really careful. We cannot. Yeah, I will put a disclaimer. I put a disclaimer at the beginning, so we are both safe, right? So none of these blah blah is medical advice, you know, things like that. Yeah, yeah. Right. What is the most important lesson that you have learned in your life on this journey? The most important lesson is that my body is my responsibility. And if, if I give that responsibility to anyone else, I'm asking for trouble. And I learned that I had to increase the amount of care that I had for myself because I certainly did not care for myself at all. And before, before I got really sick, I was pretty yeah. opinionated, pretty know-it-all and pretty arrogant. But if you would have told me you're arrogant, you're a know-it-all, I would have said, no, I'm not, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I would say things like, you would tell me that, 
You know, you should watch your health, you know, you, you should eat organic. I go, organic, yeah, right. Everything grows out of the ground, buddy. Don't talk to me about organic. I've seen the organic food is twice as much money. And, and I, I would give you that kind of an answer. And you go, you know, you could get sick eating that. Yeah, whatever, I don't care. That's what I would say. Yeah, whatever, I don't care. I would just dismiss you. So that was my mentality. That was my programming. I was a totally yep. uh, unconscious type of person. So when I hit the wall, I found out that I actually cared a lot more than I ever dreamed possible because now I'm going to have my body removed off the earth. And if my body gets removed, I am not able to interface any longer. I won't be there to help my wife raise the children. I won't be there for the people who are counting on me to be there. And I am going to be out of here at an early age. So I was like, I think I care. I'm going to start to care now. But the problem was I didn't know how to care for myself. I, I didn't have the knowledge. But I wanted to care, but I didn't know. Like, where do I start? Like, what am I doing that's so wrong? Because I'm doing what everybody else is doing, and that's not helping me. And I am genetically predisposed to an early death if I do things that are not good. Whereas other people can do things that are not good for a lot longer because they have stronger constitution. I don't have a strong constitution. I had to build a strong constitution. So today I have a super strength constitution based upon learning how to take care so when I found out about uh, being careful, full of care, I was always going to have to care more. Like, I don't care for myself enough now, today. I know that I'm going to learn more about how to take more care for myself. So it's an ongoing journey. It's, a, I'm not, it's like, no, I've arrived. It's, no, I haven't arrived. And if we think we've arrived, <clears throat> we might, we're dead. You know, we're dead in the water. So being more careful, full of care for myself, created a cu curiosity. Well, how do I care for myself? And so that, that's capacity. So we have a capacity for knowledge, a capacity for learning, a capacity for being taught, a capacity for wisdom, a capacity for experience. And then that gives you the capacity to go, oh, that's how it works, okay. And then the next thing is I had to learn, I had to earn courage. I had very little courage. Because then you do stuff and you suffer, and I don't like that, you know? And so I had to <laughs> learn to earn courage and you have to get a bank account full of courage. And the more courage I got, the more I did, the more I learned, oh, that worked actually. Okay, that, that involved a bit of suffering, that's okay. The results were phenomenal, that stopped a bunch of suffering. So I suffered a little bit to stop a world of suffering. And then that made me get more interested in caring for myself more. So the more you learn how to care for your body, the more skillful you get at that, the more responsibility you can take, and the greater capacity you have to learn, and then the more courage you have to take action. So it's like that, it's like the three C's or they just happen to start with the letter C for some reason. So care, capacity, courage, and you keep building that. Okay, beautiful. Mr. Clark, it was a pleasure to have you on a podcast. I hope you come back again for more. And uh, where can people find out about you, your products and your social medias? All right, well, to to direct people to where they can get the information and also get access to the products. We have a website called activationproducts.com and we also have a subscription where people can get a newsletter and get information. We also have a membership site being built as we speak. It's not quite ready to go yet, but it's a community that we are now ready to create to have support mechanisms within the community itself to give people the access to information. I can be found on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Uh, we're just getting going in the social media side because I had to wait all these years for the information to mature, to be able to publish the things that we know we don't have to iterate later. It's the definitive information. It's very mature info. It's super simple to understand. It's very contrary to mainstream. So you gotta be ready for some courage there. Uh, but, but it's proven facts that we are sharing with everybody and once you're in the bubble, you're going to find that you can gain a lot of value for yourself and stay there and bring your value into that bubble as well. Okay, beautiful. I will put all the links into all the videos. And I want to thank you very much for coming on the Positive Club. Well, thank you so much for having me, Z. It's been a pleasure. Have a great day. Likewise.